Venus flytraps are an amazing and unique plant and very enjoyable to keep. They are, no kidding, or can be very difficult to keep too, particularly for the casual plant keeper. But this is also what attracts a lot of us to the Venus flytrap, the challenge of keeping them. Venus flytraps have a specific set of conditions they need to thrive and grow well. They need a soil that is very low in nutrition or fertilizer, preferably acidic. They need water constantly that is very low in minerals or fertilizer, such as rainwater, distilled water, or reverse osmosis water. They absolutely need a winter break to go dormant for a few months. So. Let's think about where we as consumers get most of our Venus flytraps from. Most of them are propagated from clippings and grown in greenhouses. Quite a few of these greenhouses are in Florida or South Florida. So right off the bat, they're growing in an unnatural environment or more or less perpetual or constant summer. So what I found is you get the best growth and the most success out of a Venus flytrap after it has gone through a dormant period. In other words, putting them through a dormant period sort of resets their biological clock. Putting the plant through a dormant period tells it where it is in the world. In other words, springtime is start time. Fall or the end of fall is dormant time. Once you get your plants through this and get them reset, to the schedule that they are meant to be on, they do so much better. Peat moss and sand or peat moss and perlite is a messier medium. When it rains, the peat moss tends to splash up all over the plants and the traps. Pyrolite tends to float and collect at the top of the pots. If you're OCD, it will mess with your OCD a bit, but peat moss is definitely easier for crawling bugs to walk across than sphangum moss. Peat moss also tends to stay warmer, so if you're in a cooler climate, your plants will likely come out of hibernation and start to prosper more quickly in peat moss than in longleaf sphangum moss. I live on the western side of South Carolina, about three and a half hours from the coast. It does freeze here from time to time, but we rarely get hard freezes. I built this small greenhouse to overwinter my fly traps and pitcher plants in. I put a small incandescent lamp on the top of it that I can turn on any time the temperature at night was expected to go below freezing. Today in our era of LED lighting, when I say incandescent, I mean an older traditional light bulb that puts off heat. It's now early March. Let's take a look inside. It stayed nice and damp in here. The plants have all gotten some good natural sunlight over the winter, and they've gone through a natural cold period for several months of 32 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So when spring comes, their biological clocks will be set, regardless of where they were born and lived their early lives, like a greenhouse in South Florida. Now that we're in early spring here, I'm moving them all out to their summer home. I'm using these cement mixing troughs from Lowe's as a basin. They are inexpensive, they look decent. And I can put a few inches of distilled water in the bottom of them to keep the soil in their pots constantly moist, even in the hottest days of summer. I'll cut a small drain hole about two inches up from the bottom so that if we have a heavy rain, the water will drain out and the level of water in the basin will stay the same. 
This constant moisture is necessary for Venus flytraps and having the water seep up from the bottom and keep the roots moist is the best way to go rather than trying to water them from the top. It's natural and what the flytrap roots are built for. Like the bog areas of their homeland, notice these plant pots are all tall. But there are obviously a few concerns with keeping plant pots in a basin like this. The first is mosquitoes, particularly here. These basins are going to fill up with mosquitoes. So my solution to that is to put tiny fish in there, just a couple per basin, not enough to really add a lot of fertilizer to the water, but enough tiny fish to keep all the mosquito larvae down. Mosquito fish are a good choice, goldfish, or these baby koi, which I have good supply of. A second concern is if these pots are all sitting in a basin of water, basically like a moat, walking insects are going to have a hard time getting to the Venus flytraps and feeding the Venus flytraps naturally. So every once in a while, I just lean a stick up against the basin and give walking insects a bridge to get up to the plants. Flying insects, of course, have no problem. And actually, the water of these basins attracts a lot of flying insects. Obviously, it's good to change the water every once in a while to clean out any debris that's accumulating. With every solution, there comes a problem, though. The cat has spotted the fish. Most of the Venus flytraps we buy come pre-potted in a small pot with sphangum moss. I don't like to disturb the roots on these plants. They're fragile and I don't like to disrupt or shock them. So when I'm repotting a new flytrap, I just leave the bundle of sphangum moss around it and I put the whole bundle into the new pot. The roots will easily grow beyond the original potting sphangum and into the new media in the bigger pot. The only reason I personally would strip all of this moss away to the bare roots is if it was contaminated with mold or fungus or when I order plants by mail, which will usually come with the bare roots wrapped in a moist napkin. We also hear constantly that Venus flytraps need loads and loads of direct sunlight. This can be misleading. If you look at and study the Venus flytraps in their natural environment in and around the Wilmington, North Carolina area, you'll see that they often actually grow in the underbrush and are shaded by other taller plants and pine trees. So you can easily burn up your Venus flytraps if you give them too much direct hot sunlight. This will depend on where you live though. Arizona heat is different than humid South Carolina heat, for instance. So as with any other plants you're keeping, observe them and adjust to find your perfect formula. A lot of sunlight is generally good. Just don't let them dry out or burn up.
I personally am not a fan of cutting the flowering stems off in the spring. I know we hear a lot of people recommend cutting the stem off with the argument that the flowering stem is consuming too much of the plant's energy unnecessarily. I've actually had Venus flytrap stop growing or just go into a weird dormant stage after cutting the flowering stems off. I think cutting the flowering stems off disrupts the plant's normal seasonal schedule, sort of like a hormonal disruption. Consider again how necessary it is for a Venus flytrap to go through a dormant phase in the winter. Why would we now disrupt this natural cycle it needs by cutting off the flowering stem? It really depends on what your goal is. Here I want these flytraps to grow naturally and be healthy for the long term. Large, healthy rhizomes. Also, I think the flowers are pretty. Nice to look at and I think the stem actually helps attract bugs to the plant. It gives them a place to land and from there they'll often climb down the stem and onto the plant and into a trap. Bam! Feeding time. Research has shown that the actual pollinators are not likely to be eaten by the traps. If it's spring or midsummer or late summer and you're just now buying your plants, get them in a basin of distilled water, reverse osmosis water or rainwater, and keep them happy and healthy until fall, and then put them through a dormant period of a few months either by keeping them outdoors in the cold and not letting them freeze hard or by taking them and setting them in the bottom of your refrigerator for two to three months. Refrigerator lighting is not an issue when the plant is dormant. Then you can bring them outside in the spring. You can and should do a water basin system even if you only have one plant. Just get a deep bowl and keep a bit of distilled water in it at all times Obviously only use glazed or plastic plant pots and bowls. Clay or cement pots will leach way too many minerals into the water and your flytrap won't survive very long. You can easily do a water basin system and still make it look decorative and beautiful. If you go out of town for a week, just set the plant into a larger bowl or basin so it will stay moist until you get back. Just a few weeks after coming out of the greenhouse cover, these plants are all getting plenty to eat and nice big new traps are forming. It looks like crane flies are the easiest prey around here. I bought these B-52s online last year early summer around June. They were labeled small B-52s. They sat dormant all summer long last year. So it's good to see that now they've gone through a winter season, they are finally taking off and growing well. It's best to get spiders and spider webs away from your traps. Spiders in general are smart and most aren't likely to be caught in the traps and obviously they are there trying to steal the food that the traps would normally be getting. Watch this video a few times and just kind of familiarize yourself with why this system is working for me. Even if you have just one small pot and one small basin, you should be able to have similar results. Watering the Venus flytrap roots from the bottom upward with a water basin system. Using only distilled water, you can get this for a dollar a gallon at the grocery store or reverse osmosis water or rainwater. 
Using only unfertilized peat moss, clean sand, or sphanga moss as potting medium. Giving your Venus flytraps a dormant purity of three months a year at about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Giving your flytraps plenty of sun or dappled sunlight. And as long as your traps are catching a bug or two a month, you should have success with your Venus flytraps and get so much enjoyment out of them.